of scales that different chemicals occur at um, up to what you can see, but there's a there's a whole world of, of chemistry down there. And the next one is just a this graph is gives an indication of how broadly chemicals are distributed in waters with respect to concentration. And so this is just a survey of the major rivers of the world, basically, and the chemistry of those rivers. And it's, and it's a cumulative frequency diagram. So what it says is, we can start with iron, that the concentration milligram from iron, about 40% of the samples had a concentration bigger than this, which is 10 to the minus 2 to 3 times point, so it's point zero 0.03 milligrams per liter. And none of the samples had a concentration much higher um, than about uh, 4 or 5 milligrams per liter, right? So that's how it works. But the, the wider these are, the wider the range of concentrations that are seen in natural waters. And the further over to the right they are, the higher the concentration is. Um, and this just happens to be in terms of mass. So we can see some of these metals are pretty str uh, strung out. And then we're starting to get into some of the things like nitrogen, which is required for life. Um, iron is also. And uh, silicon is fairly narrowly constrained uh, because it's sort of not very soluble, but there's a lot of it around. And, and so that's fairly narrowly constrained. And we've got these ranges of things, and then all of them have to sum to the total dissolved solid. Okay, so the next thing to talk about is redox. And redox, oxidation reduction potential, is an important way to think about chemicals and how much energy they have, depending upon the solution that they're dissolved in. So essentially, redox is a measure of free electron availability. And if you have a redox probe, it's essentially measuring how many electrons are free to react with that probe relative to a solution with hydrogen. If chemicals are in a different redox state than the solution they're in, they have potential energy. And so we can start by looking at <coughs> chemicals. And chemicals can be oxidized. So if they're oxidized, they have few free electrons. Or they can be reduced. And if they're reduced, then they tend to give up their electrons easily. Right. And so we could have, we could do this based on um, two ions, sulfate and sulfide. And guess which of these two ions is more is a more oxidized ion? There's a pretty obvious clue on here. Sulfate, Sulfate right? Because it actually has more oxygens that have reacted with it. Okay, so we can think of these two co uh, compounds, sulfide and sulfate, right? And we can put them in solution. And if we have this Gibbs free energy diagram, the y-axis is the potential energy. <coughs> the x-axis doesn't really mean much in these diagrams. It doesn't, it's just putting things apart. And if we have a solution that's pretty oxidized, which of these chemicals would you guess has more potential energy? a lot of oxygen floating around, which of the chemicals would be more likely to react with that oxygen is another way of putting it. Sulfide. Sulfide, right? Sulfide has more, more potential energy because if you're in a, an aqueous solution that has oxygen dissolved in it, it's basically got a big demand for electrons. So anything that has a lot of electrons associated with it will, re, will tend to react with that oxygen, right? So if we have an oxidized solution, then we have the sulfide has a higher potential energy than the sulfate, right? 
Yes. What was on the y-axis? What's that? That's a Gibbs free energy. It's just the amount of energy that's available in this particular solution. So the sulfide has higher free energy. This just has higher free energy than the sulfate. Right? And then we can go back to our introductory chemistry and you can convert the sulfide to sulfate. And is that going to release or take energy to make that reaction go? Is it endothermic or exothermic? Sort of. How about overall process? Pardon? Right. And the, so the net thing is, since it's going from more potential energy to less potential energy, it's going to be releasing energy overall. But for the reaction to occur, you need a little bit of energy. You need to push it over this hill. So you put in a little bit of energy, and you get back more to make the reaction. So organisms have enzymes, and enzymes catalyze reaction. What does that mean they're doing to the activation energy? They lower the activation energy, right? So if we have an organism that is using sulfide as a source of energy in this environment, and there are chemoautotrophic organisms that do that, it's basically lowering the activation energy to make that conversion of sulfide to sulfate. In the case of this particular ion pair, this reaction will go without, there's enough energy in the typical temperatures for sulfide to react with oxygen to make sulfate. So the organisms that make a living this way have to be right where that sulfide comes into the environment and snatched up before the reaction occurs because they can react it faster. Okay, so then what we can do is we can switch context. So all this was based on the idea that there's oxygen dissolved in the solution, right? Let's make a very anoxic situation, a very low redox situation, where there's lots of free electrons available. And we redraw it equals plus O2, and we can say this is minus O2, and it'll turn out it's minus some other chemicals too, but so in this particular situation, does the sulfate or the sulfide have a greater potential energy? Sulfate. The sulfate has greater potential energy, correct. So you just switch. You switch the reaction. So if you're in this sort of situation and you want to take sulfide to sulfate, as an organism, do you have to put in energy or do you get back energy overall, over the whole reaction? Put more in. You have to put more energy in to get it out. And it turns out that this is a real reaction that occurs because the early form of photosynthesis, rather than splitting water, uses sulfide as an electron donor and pushes sulfide to sulfate. And we'll see how this might be one of the ways that early life essentially was was driven before uh, oxygenic photosynthesis when we get to the sulfur cycle. So this flip here is occurring because of the context the ion's in and what their redox state is relative to their solution. The basic idea, the more different the compound is from the redox of the solution that it's in, the more potential energy it has. This means that evolution will lead to organisms that harvest that energy successfully, right? And if an organism needs to take that compound and put it to a redox state that's more similar to the environment that it's in, it's gonna take energy. But this is context dependent in the solution that you're in, right? The, it's the rel redox relative to the redox of the solution. That's the thing that gets difficult for students to figure out. But it's very important 
very important to understand nutrient cycling and what goes with and what goes against potential energy. And it'll help you memorize the nutrient cycles. The bad news is you have to memorize the nutrient cycles. And you have to be able to draw them from scratch. But if I give you a logical framework to draw them from scratch with, then the chance that you'll remember it will become substantially greater. So that's where I'm going with all this. Do you have any questions on that? So this is a figure in the book. Um, I believe I've uh, got two, two exam points off this figure because he did what I said and read the text before this class and he noticed that in the text the word, the word yield is misspelled. And that was courtesy of the artists that they hired to redraft all my figures. And I didn't realize they made a lot of mistakes at the beginning. I recall a lot of them, but I missed a lot of them. So this is the same sort of example. We have an oxidizing environment, then we have NH4 and NO3, NH4 plus and NO3 minus. The ammonium has more potential energy than the nitrate in the oxidizing environment. So there's a release of energy if you go this direction. If you have to take nitrate and turn it into ammonium in an oxidizing environment, then it takes it. And then if you flip it, you get into a reducing environment. If nitrate goes to ammonium in a reducing environment, it releases energy, and organisms do this to oxidize organic carbon. And if you want to take ammonium to nitrate, it takes energy. Generally, organisms don't do this because it costs energy. There's not really much reason to do it. Are these graphs, like, if it's... So this is in an oxygen-rich environment? Oxidizing, yep, <coughs> reducing, okay. exactly. So I'll always have to give you the context if I'm asking you this question. And, the, and our cycles will have that context in it as well. All right? Seems simple now. Just wait till I ask you a question on the test. Bronson? Yeah, so however you can remember, and you can go on Google and you can probably come up with 10 different mnemonic devices to do that, because I've heard quite a few. So the one thing now on this graph, what I want to do is talk about redox of some biologically important molecules. So we have different molecules and they're changed by biological reactions and that changes their redox state. So we can talk, for example, if you're taking an, uh, on this redox scale, you have lots of free electrons is negative, not many free electrons is positive. If oxygen's in solution, you're, you're going to end up being on this side of the scale. If, regardless of what your redox is, if you're moving a compound from the left to the right of this figure, you're oxidizing the compound. If you move one from the right to the left, you're reducing the compound. So this arrow, sulfate reduction, is going from sulfate to sulfide. And it's a net decrease in the redox potential of that molecule. The way biology works is it's actually coupling these reactions to each other. So you can say at the very top you have oxygen reduction, right? And that couples with the oxidation of organic matter. So the net difference between those two gives you the overall energy yield of oxidizing organic carbon with oxygen. In contrast, you can also use nitrate to oxidize organic carbon, but you're starting further towards the reduced nature of the organic matter. 
and so you're going to have less energy yield. It's less efficient to oxidize organic carbon with nitrate than it is with oxygen. So we'll come up with that again too. This is going to determine the order that the interactions occur with each other and how the chemical nutrient cycles interact with each other. Okay. So I will get back to this. I'll come back to this. It's very complex. It's a lot of information I'm throwing at you. You'll actually maybe not know the exact numbers that go with this, but you'll actually understand logically sort of where the arrows are relative to each other when you're done learning all the nutrient cycles. So I'm giving you an overview. I'll go through individual nutrient cycles, and then I'll review back and link them all together with this redox. So we can think of a practical example of iron and redox in a natural environment. So this is a seasonal graph here, the x-axis going from spring through the year to the following spring. And the numbers give, the numbers and then the darker shading in the top is warmer temperatures, the darker shading in the next one down is more oxygen, the darker shading in the next one down is higher redox, and the darker shading in the last one down is higher higher, higher iron to understand this particular pattern, there's a piece of information you need to know, and that is the oxidized form of iron precipitates out of solution. Okay, so the oxidized form of iron precipitates out of solution. So if oxygen is present, it's going to make this flocculent stuff and it's going to fall down out of solution. Some of you may have to be on rural drinking water that has high iron concentrations in the groundwater that you get out of your well. And if you pour your water into a glass and you set it there for about a half hour, it fills with this flocculent orange stuff. Right? Anybody have that experience at all? Anybody? No, nobody has that? You've had that? Got well. yeah. And what's happening is you have anoxic water, it dissolves the iron, you bring it up, your tap oxygenates the water, and then it converts itself into oxidized iron, which then precipitates out with the oxygen. What do we call precipitate? What do we call iron that's reacted with oxygen? Common name? Iron oxide. Iron oxide, yeah. What's Rick another rust. name for it? Rust, right? So it's just this sort of rustiness that's in your water. Not going to hurt you in the slightest. I mean, maybe if you got huge, huge amounts of it, but in the drinking water, it's not going to hurt you. So people, it's, it's unpleasant to look at to see this brown flock in the water, but it's, it's not going to hurt you. So some of you have had practical experience with that. If you ever see it now, you'll know what that is. Okay, so we have this lake, and it's a dimictic lake, right? That is, it is mixing in what two seasons? Spring and fall. Spring and fall, good. And it's stratified during the summertime and the winter because the ice cap is keeping it from mixing. And as it stratifies up in the summertime, the production in the epilimnion creates organic carbon. And that organic carbon falls down, but because it's stratified, it can't mix, right? And, and what type of fusion diffusion ha would have to occur to get the material across the epilimnion into across the metalimnion from the hypolimnion into the epilimnion? Molecular. Molecular diffusion. It's quite slow. So the microbes that are down here are eating up that oxygen. They're, they're, they're taking the oxygen out of solution to oxidize organic carbon, right? They're respiring and driving the oxygen down to zero. So you have this anoxic hypolimnion, just like we saw at Potawatomi State Lake number two. As the oxygen disappears, the redox drops. Right, so there's low redox. There's lots of electrons here, not many electrons here because there's oxygen in the water at the epilimnion but not in the hypolimnion. And lastly, the iron can come into solution so the concentrations can get quite high in the absence of oxygen. But any time where there's presence of oxygen, it's pretty low and barely detectable. And you see also a little blip of low oxygen stratifies here, it's not mixing very well, you get the sediments using up oxygen, a little bit of lower redox, a little bit higher detectable iron down there. 
And so that's just a typical, uh, the practical example of how we're linking together the physical characteristics in the lake with the oxygen, the redox, and the concentrations of one molecule that organisms need. Like they need iron for, for chlorophyll and re, uh, electron transport of proteins. And a biologically important molecule and how that relates to cycling over the lakes to oxygen. 